Good morning, and welcome to St. John's by the Sea Church, this 20th Sunday after Trinity, October 25th, 2020. This Sunday we look at Jesus' parable of the wedding feast, the joys, those who have, who accept his invitation, and the wrath that those who reject his invitation will meet. Let us now prepare our hearts in worship. O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. The hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, 
We have have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which he ought to have done, and we have done those things which he ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent, according to your promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, has given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all those who truly repent and genuinely believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beg him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The first lesson is taken from St. Paul's Epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 5, beginning at the 15th verse. Look carefully, then, how you walk not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. But be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. second lesson is taken from St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, beginning at the first verse. And again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready. But those invited were not worthy. 
Go therefore to the main roads, and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads, and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guest, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us now recite our profession of faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning. This morning we have the opportunity to reflect on the parable Jesus told of the wedding banquet. It's a parable of incredible love, incredible grace to people who don't deserve it, and a picture of God's wrath on those who refuse God's grace and refuse his generous invitation. And now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Jesus' parable about the wedding feast is probably his most complete and clear parable. It includes every single person on the face of the earth, everyone who has lived, is living, or will live. And you, listening to me this morning, are found in this parable. It's also a parable which is pretty easy to understand. It gives us a picture of God's plan of redemption and our glorious future, the fulfillment of prophecy, as Christ makes a prophecy here, which was fulfilled in history, which many people don't even know about. It shows us a picture of the terrifying nature of God's wrath on unrepentant sinners, but only after we see God's patient hand, restraining his wrath, appealing to those who refuse to accept his welcome and warm invitation. This is another parable which takes place on probably the Tuesday or Wednesday before the crucifixion. 
Throughout Matthew chapter 21, Jesus has told a number of parables about the evils of the chief priests and the Pharisees. They knew he was talking about him in the parables, but they were afraid to do anything because the crowds all thought Jesus was a prophet. So they waited their time and they were about to come and try to trick him or trap him in a number of little things which we've discussed over the last couple of weeks. But Jesus, after they leave, then tells a parable to anyone who will listen to him while he's teaching in the temple that everyone is on notice because there is no neutrality with God. We cannot say we are just a simple bystander. Either we joyfully acknowledge and worship our Creator and enjoy His fellowship and the great things that He has for us, or we reject Him. Even if we don't want to call it that we're rejecting Him, we are very much rejecting him. The parable begins, and again Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gives a wedding feast for his son, and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Before we get into those not coming, Right away, it's very clear who the characters are. The king is God. And the father, the king, wants to throw a great wedding banquet for his son. Obviously, who represents Jesus. There is a similar parable we read a few weeks ago from Luke. But that parable has a couple of important differences in it. As you may know, Luke and Matthew have slightly different focuses in who they're writing to and oftentimes record even the same experiences from slightly different perspectives. And here is the gospel, clear as day if you didn't catch it, so wonderful. God the Father is lovingly inviting people to a wedding banquet. That's good news. We're not called to a life of slavery, to an angry master, which is what Islam teaches. We are not busy servants trying to run around and do enough good that we can get into heaven, as Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormonism teaches. The parable continues. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the feast. We are guests, lovingly invited to a wedding feast by a king. In fact, we can see from other pictures in the scripture that when it describes who we are in the church, we are described sometimes as the bride of Christ. We are also pointed to in different illustrations as adopted sons and daughters of God. God's call to us may include labor in the short term as on hearing the call, if you've already gotten to the end of the parable, you know we are to turn around and invite others to the wedding feast. But ultimately, it is a call to an eternal feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb, not to torture or labor, but to God's love. So at this time in Israel, it's good to know that wedding feasts would normally take place for about seven days. That's the average feast. But even with that, you can just imagine the preparation that would entail and why, as we saw in John chapter 2, sometimes wedding feasts, they run out of wine. It was considered really bad form because you were supposed to be prepared to feed your guests for the entire length of the feast. But that's the standard wedding feast. That's not 
a king's banquet. When a king has a banquet, it goes far beyond that. Esther, interestingly, begins this way. Now in the days of Ahasuerus, who's also known as Xerxes, who reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 127 provinces, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors of the province were before him while he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendors of his pomp, of his greatness for 180 days. Imagine requesting that off from work to go attend a wedding. And I don't think that our God is going to be outdone by a pagan king. Though Christ's words are few in the parable, what we have tries to be descriptive of a parable showing the lavishness of what our Father has prepared for us. The great feast, oxen and fatted calves. Now, just one average cow today can feed a family of four for more than a year. And this shows the lavishness and the wonders that God has for us. Because these are fatted calves and oxen. And it shows that with multiples there, Christ is showing that what God has prepared for us is far greater than we can imagine. And you know what? If the parable would have ended here, it would be one of the happiest parables there is. And unfortunately, it doesn't. In terms of understanding what's going on, Obviously, probably everybody knows there were no refrigerators back in those days. So when you were preparing a feast, you would send out invitations far in advance because it would take so much time to prepare such a feast. If you've put together a wedding, you know, even for a wedding banquet, how much time it takes to prepare for just a short period of time. Imagine what it takes place to prepare for a week or a month, or six months in the, in the case of King Xerxes. So invitations were sent out far in advance, and like nowadays, people would reply that they would be coming to the feast. It was sent out in advance because you needed to set time aside for an extended period to put your house in order so that you would be able to attend. So when the invitation finally comes, though they knew the day was coming, though they had already been invited and were supposed to have set aside time, the people who were invited chose to either ignore the invitation or to just outright reject the king and kill his servants. Those who were invited symbolize the corrupt leadership of the time. The same leadership who rejected the prophets, God's servants. And what does God do when time and time again his prophets are killed? He graciously sends another to invite them. Other prophets come, some of them ignoring what the prophets say. And they'd rather, we see, in this parable, they'd rather go off to work. They'd rather go off to their fields or businesses than come to a wedding feast. What kind of work is that? And that's kind of the problem we have in rejecting God. We are rejecting great love and great providence to take basically nothing. Others treated the servants shamefully and killed them. And it's all culminating in the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, when you honestly think about it, it would have been completely reasonable to understand that when the guests were first invited, who would promise they would attend, that the king would have either met them with anger at that point 
But instead, what do we see? We see the patience and love of the king. Look again at verse 4. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatted calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the feast. This is not anger. This is love. This is graciousness. And it's an invitation to the great feast, not some potluck where you need to bring stuff and you don't know what's going to be there. This is amazing that it would have been God's response after rejection and dishonor. That the king again and again extends his hand. Some who ignored the prophets thought they were too busy to pay attention to God. We cram so much into our lives with time wasters and distractions. And I'm sure even during our time of lockdown, uh, which seems to be returning again, we found new ways to distract ourselves. And I, I saw a story this week in preparing of a man who told his wife that he never wanted to live in a vegetative state, depending on a machine. He says, if I ever get in that shape, I want you to pull the plug. So she got up and unplugged the television. And there are others who outwardly and publicly despise God and everything the Bible stands for. They are not imagining themselves to be neutral or ignoring God. They know who he is and they reject them. And they're not just limited to the Democratic Party's leadership. That just happens to be the most vocal ones. The Marxist propaganda that we've seen behind the rioting that's been going on would love nothing more than to destroy belief in God. And this is why groups like Black Lives Matter have hosted Bible burning times in addition to flag burnings. And this is especially up into Portland. It, very easy to search this on the internet to see what they're doing. It's kind of surprising, however, or maybe not so surprising, that very few media sources report it because when you're burning the Bible, it tends to get people's attention. But Marxism, socialism, communism, which these groups are based on, hates Christianity, rejects Christianity. But the story doesn't end there. As we continue the parable, after the second set of servants were killed, we read, the king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And here's where knowing a little bit of history and what happened after Christ ascended to heaven in the early days of the church and in the time after Matthew had finished writing his gospel to be sent out to the churches. What happened in Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem was attacked by the Romans because of their continued rebellion. And they were met with Roman justice. Here's a quote from Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian, as he talks about Jerusalem's destruction in 70 AD. While the temple was ablaze, the attackers plundered it, and countless people who were caught by them were slaughtered. There was no pity for age and no regard for rank. Children and old men, laymen and priests alike were butchered, whether they cried out for mercy or offered resistance. And the temple where Jesus was preaching, he writes, the Temple Mount, everywhere enveloped in flames and seemed to be boiling over from its base. Yet the blood seemed more abundant than the flames. In all, in that rather brief war, 1.1 million Jewish people were slaughtered in Jerusalem. 
Josephus does record that the Christians saw the signs of the time and left the city quickly before the siege did not allow them to leave. But in addition to the 1.1 million Jews that died, some from being killed by the Romans troops and others from simple starvation afterwards, malnourishment, another 100,000 were taken away into slavery. Why did this happen? What does Jesus say was their crime? Why were they found unworthy? Well, some openly rejected, while others quietly ignored the call of the King, the God the Father in heaven. And what was his call? To come and celebrate his Son. To God, those who ignore and those who rebel openly are the same, and they met with the same results, the same punishment. This is one of the reasons I like to study history, because it so sh clearly shows us God has a plan, and he works it out through history, even in the worst of situations. Here we have something horrible, but it's something that shows God's tr truth. And it tells us exactly what Jesus said would happen 40 years after he said it would happen. And it doesn't simply end there. After the city is burned, there is a very different welcome from the king. One that Christ says would happen, and one which in history we see did happen. The parable continues. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. History again helps us to see how God's plan explained here by Christ would take place exactly as Jesus laid it out in this parable. So after the first group was found to be unworthy, the king's servants were told to go therefore out into the main road and gather all whom they found. In fact, the phrase, go therefore, should sound rather familiar because it's the same words that Matthew uses at the very end of his gospel when he s describes Jesus' great commission to go therefore to all nations, making disciples and baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And this is how you can tell that Jesus is intentionally using this to look forward to what the mission of the church would be. And it's one of the interesting things about Jerusalem in particular is that that city had a main road, which went pretty much everywhere in the known world. Wherever you wanted to travel, quite often it would take you through Jerusalem. If you wanted to go from Africa to Turkey, or even further into Europe, to Greece, different areas like that, almost most of the time you would take the road through Jerusalem if you were traveling by land. Now, one of the questions I had when I first heard something like that was, why didn't they just sail straight across? And the, the truth is, it was too dangerous. Whenever they would sail at this time, because of the winds and the storms that came on the Mediterranean, they would tr hug the coast, basically, wherever they went. They didn't try to sail straight across the Mediterranean. Also, if you wanted to travel, say, from Egypt, from Alexandria, one of the great cities of the ancient world, over to Persia or even to India, or the reverse, you had to go through Jerusalem. There was no other way. So the roads 
that the servants were sent to come out and make invitations to had people traveling from everywhere people traveling to everywhere and all are encouraged to come to the feast regardless of where they came from what language they spoke or where they were going it was a road that people all over the world would travel for business for pilgrimages for pleasure and that's one of the really neat things when you look in the fullness of time there was at that particular time one common language Greek that was spoken throughout pretty much the known world there was one nation the Roman Empire that built good roads to go wherever you wanted to go and it was at this time that Jesus came he couldn't have come 40 years later because the temple would have been destroyed and the prophecies from the Old Testament speak about him standing in the temple he couldn't have come too much earlier than that because too much earlier than that and there is no Roman Empire especially there's no Roman Empire in that area of Israel it was a Roman Republic but they hadn't conquered all that much by that time again on the day of Pentecost we see God's people began their mission how did they do it there were travelers there from all over the world they were coming to worship in God's temple and they heard each in their own language the mighty works of God and they took that message back to where they lived when persecution eventually pushed the Christian church forcefully out of Jerusalem and then out of Judea they used these roads to bring God's invitation everywhere from Ethiopia where st. Matthew is said to have gone all the way to India where they say that Thomas was the Apostle who founded the churches there those who are commissioned to invite others to the wedding banquet feast invited everyone they found uses the word the good and the bad now of course we know that's relative terms uh, there are some who outwardly show their detesting of God and his laws and intentionally live their lives in wickedness but those are ones who are supposed to be invited there are ones who live their lives in self-righteousness and they too are invited whether a nun or an abortion worker the call is for everyone to turn from where they are what they are doing and come to the marriage supper of the lamb this call is for everyone so we should rejoice that the gospel we preach is to a marriage feast not to live stuffy lives not to work hard although in the short term we will be working hard as we seek to bring that message to others but the end result is something wonderful we who were ourselves once God's enemy on the road to nowhere have heard the invitation and we are now called to bring this message to a world which needs to hear it let us pray that God will equip and enable us for this duty Lord God we thank you that you send us to a world which needs to hear your gospel we thank you that you send us with an incredible glorious message a beautiful message not simply of the opportunity to be your servants but the opportunity to be your children to sit at the king's table like one of the king's sons we pray Lord you will help us daily to rejoice in that and to rejoice in the opportunity that you have sent us to toil in the short term that your banquet hall may be filled this we beg through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen
So send I you to labor unrewarded, to serve unpaid, unloved, unsought, unknown, to bear rebuke, to suffer scorn and scoffing. So send I you. So send I you to leave your life's ambition to die to dear desire. So will resign to labor, long and love when men revile you. So send. send I you to hearts made hard by hatred, to eyes made blind because they will not see, to spend though it be blood, to spend and spare not. So send I you to taste of Calvary. Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, we beg you, grant your people grace to withstand the temptations of the world, the flesh, and the devil, and with pure hearts and minds to follow you, the only God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O eternal God, our Heavenly Father, who alone makes men to be of one mind in a house and stills the outrage of a violent and unruly people. We bless your holy name and ask that it would please you to appease the seditious tumults which have been lately raised up amongst us, most humbly begging you to grant us grace that we may obediently walk in your holy commandments, lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, and continually offer unto you our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving for these your mercies toward us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O most mighty and merciful God, to whom alone belong the issues of life and death, in this time of grievous sickness, we flee unto you for relief. Deliver us, we beg you, from our peril. Give strength and skill to your ministers of healing. Bless the means of cure, and grant that, perceiving how frail is our earthly life, we may apply our hearts unto that heavenly wisdom which leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, the high and mighty ruler of the universe, who does from your throne behold all the dwellers upon earth, most heartily, we beg you, with your favor, to behold and bless your servant, Donald Trump, our president, our Senate and representatives in Congress assembled, Philip Murphy, the governor of New Jersey, Tom Wolf, the governor of Pennsylvania, and all others in authority. And so replenish them with the grace of your Holy Spirit, that they may always incline to your will and walk in your way. Empower them plenteously with heavenly gifts. Grant them in health and prosperity long to live. And finally, after this life, to attain everlasting joy and happiness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, 
the strong tower and refuge of your people. We entreat your favor upon the officers and all who are enlisted in the service of defense of our country. Ever spare them from being ordered into a war of aggression or oppression. Use them, if need be, as your instruments in the defense of our national life and liberty. By restraining, we beg you, the greed and wrath of man, that wars may cease in all the earth. Watch over also all policemen and law enforcement officers everywhere, especially Tim Richfalski. Protect them from harm in the performance of their duty. We pray also for firefighters, first responders, and health care workers who protect us and ours from all types of danger. Give these men and women the courage and skills to carry out their duties well and safely. When they must go into the face of danger, be by their side. Watch over their families, reminding them that those who go into danger are in your loving care. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, from whom comes every good and perfect gift, send down upon our bishops, especially Foley, Ray, and Chuck, and other clergy, and upon the congregations committed to their charge, the healthful spirit of your grace, that they may truly please you, pour upon them the continual dew of your blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our Advocate and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beg you for all sorts and conditions of men, that you would be pleased to make your ways known unto them, your saving health unto all nations. More especially, we pray for your holy church universal, that it may be so guided and governed by your good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith and unity of spirit in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to your fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, especially those for whom our prayers are desired. We pray for churches and people who have jobs or businesses that have been so greatly affected by the virus. We pray especially for Heather and Al. We pray for Larry and we pray you will strengthen him in body and mind, for Mark, for Roy, and Bill. We pray, Lord, for Rachel, and we thank you for her continued recovery, for Dominic, for Brian, for Al. We pray for Jane, Sydney, Nick, Gage, and Marlene, for Jonathan, for Marion and Doris, for Alex, Connie, Frankie Jacoby, for Margie and her upcoming knee surgery this Thanksgiving, for Rochelle and her parents, both who are suffering with cancer, for Elma Ashton, for Jenna McQuaid, for Lauren and her unborn son. And we give thanks, Lord, for the good news concerning Tony Coleman that it may please you to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty, Almighty God, God, Father of all mercies, we, we your unworthy servants, servants give humble and hearty thanks, thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We, we bless you for our creation, creation preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that our hearts may be truly thankful and that we may declare your praise not only with our lips but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen.
Almighty God, you have promised to hear the petitions of those who ask in your Son's name. Mercifully accept us who have now made our prayers and petitions to you, and grant us those things which we have asked in faith, according to your will, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The, the grace, grace of our, our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and, and the love of God, and, and the, the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost be, be with, with us all evermore. evermore. Amen. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. As we consider usually at this time, I would remind you to support your local parish. Um, when possible, you can do that now by going to church. St. John's Church is now open for 8.30 and 10 o'clock services every Sunday, and you are welcome to attend. We do have certain restrictions up for the safety of everyone, including wearing a mask and keeping social distance. And we have the church interior set up to assist with that. But we certainly would welcome you to come and attend. If you are not able to attend and would like to support our ministry anyway, you may check out below our link to our church website, which has information on how you can support it. Or of course, as always, you can write a check and mail it to the church. Also, while you're checking out below, please, if you are not subscribed already, please subscribe to St. John's by the Sea and click on the bell icon after you subscribe. Also, feel free to like the videos. That's always a nice thing, and it helps the videos to get promoted through YouTube. Thank you for visiting St. John's by the Sea Church. Did you get that one? Yeah. Thank you for visiting St. John's on by the church. This is this is no one called staying in the what's that called? Thank you for visiting staying on by the church. This is Carter and not Noah. Only Carter. This is Carter and Noah. Thank you for visiting St. John's. Hi. Thank you for visiting St. John's. Bye, Jesus.